Hi friends, I am Vijay Sardi here for you, your anthropology faculty. I have been teaching anthropology for quite some time and uh, my entire experience in civil services coaching is more than 23 years now. Right, I have uh, loved teaching right from my college days and I have been enjoying that for quite some time and uh, teaching is a passion, it is a natural occurrence to me and uh, anthropology is a natural fit for me because I feel uh, I, I enjoy each and every moment of life and I would like to contribute to the society and in that way I have selected UPSC IAS exam as my target but of course uh, tough luck I could not go there but uh, God has given me a new opportunity to share my knowledge with the student community. So, I have been that is the reason I say I, I enjoy teaching a lot, so that became a natural fit for me. So, let us go ahead and uh, without wasting much time, we will see um, the syllabus first introduction to the papers, paper 1 and paper 2 of uh, anthropology syllabus for the UPSC examination, right. So, I call this as anthropology the story of mankind very interesting title right. So, anthropology usually people know that it is a study of humankind. So, it is a science of humans, it is a science of human culture and civilization and society. There are maybe like hundreds of definitions of anthropology, what, what anthropology is. So, every scholar has left his or her impression on this field in their own way. So, but for us for the examination purpose for the UPSC CSC. So, we need to have a unique approach for this and this unique approach why I am using this word unique approach you will realize in a very short moment because the very approach I use here is unique in itself because the we approach the subject in its uh, in its holistic dimension first and uh, we will go into breaking the subject into several parts the parts which need the utmost attention will be dealt in the first uh, phase. The parts which uh, okay, okay, you can do uh, I mean you know, with less effort also will be followed. We will try to cover entire areas and including the current uh, dimensions, current developments with a view to uh, what you call uh, the applied part and also the focus on the questions, previous years questions. So, every gamut of the entire syllabus will be covered in this uh, course. So, it will be roughly about uh, I mean 4 months approximately, sometimes even between 3 and 4 months. We will be conducting tests from time to time. I will be coming live with you guys to interact with you on every minor doubt also, even it may be a silly doubt, please do not hesitate. So, please approach me. I am approachable to the students 24 by 7 in the sense I mean on the, on the on WhatsApp as well as on call right on call between certain times, but I feel that uh, that, that uh, continuous support is uh, the must today for you people. And uh, having said that, so the syllabus of the anthropology subject, the story of mankind right the humankind is uh, in uh, spread in two two lines, I will come back to this actually. So, let us go back to the next slide. So, UPSC anthropology optional is uh, spread out in two papers, paper 1 and paper 2. Paper 1 basically uh, comprises of the conceptual knowledge. You will be required to have certain basic uh, concepts as well as applied part with uh, a lot of clarity. And uh, paper 2 will uh, definitely touch Indian uh, anthropology along with some basic knowledge which you have acquired in paper 1. So, we will be having a compendium of the two papers right in a uh, entire this this uh, period of about 4 months right, but we will focus on, on the first paper. So, now coming to the syllabus part, there are uh, 12 chapters in paper 1 right from this introduction part which starts with the meaning scope and development of anthropology right and how 
how anthropology developed as an as a social science actually anthropology is a social science anthropology is uh, uh, it's it's like a study of entire holistic uh, uh, you know picture of humans right we'll try to understand what exactly is the meaning and what kind of a scope it has got that means what kind of extent it has got today and how it was about uh, 200 years when it started as a, an area of inquiry a serious uh, question of knowing the other people and how it has developed over the period of time in due course so we'll come also to the next thing that is the relationships of anthropology with other disciplines how anthropology is as i said basically a social science right and how it has got link links with behavioral sciences and life sciences medical sciences earth sciences and humanities and what kind of uh, um i can say the the this 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 looks a bit abstract initially this entire chapter 1 looks a bit abstract even the very introduction looks like abstract right let me say very honestly but when we move forward when we touch upon all the subjects all the all the topics and the chapters you when we come back to chapter 1 the, the idea is actually the course plan is this topic will be dealt a bit later so it is like right not first things first here not according to the upsc the the listing of the the topics in the syllabus but as per our way of uh, approaching the subject as i said very clearly uniquely we will be approaching so that you will digest the tougher parts first then you will digest the easier part second then you will understand the holistic picture and you will say how anthropology then you will realize and understand how anthropology has become right a uh, part of everything anthropology is like some people consider it a uh, part of humanities some people say it's a social science some people say it has got lot of um uh, i can say bearing on earth sciences and it also takes the help of life sciences as well so it's a compendium anthropology is a holistic study of mankind as i said so it uh, it touches uh, the human life in 360 degrees it's a 360 degree discipline it's not not kind of a, a piece meal approach that we follow the very very uh, base of anthropology is this right we have to understand this core idea then as as i said the different parts of the branches of anthropology its scope and relevance will be covered there are four broad areas the subject is uh, divided into the the first is social cultural anthropology second is biological or physical anthropology right and the third one is archaeological anthropology and the fourth one is linguistic anthropology as the uh, the pioneers of the discipline have made it but uh, and of late uh, in the sense of late means in the uh, last 70 years or so a new part has got added the new part is nothing but applied anthropology though anthropology started as a field discipline it uh, if it had to grow into a unique discipline it has to have some subject matter and content so scholars had um i mean began pouring their knowledge in the form of concepts and theories and models and uh, books and ethnographies monographs a lot of lot of material was getting added and added so it became a more of theoretical discipline so people started questioning what exactly is why people waste their time spending some in some remote corners of the world because you know this the general belief is that anthropology means a study of the simple societies like some tribal societies which which are lazy people backward people they are not uh, civilized people cut off from the rest, rest of the world and uh, why these people are breaking their heads to study them so that is a general notion in the public so so this kind of questions have raised um, a new new area called applied anthropology right what is the use of knowing all this this the lifestyle of the simple people their standards their religion their their economy their uh, culture everything so usko matlab all if you if you collect that and put it at one place what is the use to the humanity so these kinds of questions led to the birth of a fifth area 
the fifth discipline, the fifth part in anthropology is applied anthropology. So, we will have a note on that as well when we move forward. We will see some more uh, parts in chapter 1. Chapter 1 has got another extraordinary area called human evolution and emergence of man. And why I am calling this as an extraordinary area? Because you will feel, you will, you know, get a chance to know our roots from where we have actually started, the origins, our origins and how we have evolved from a pre-human to a proto-human and to a human stages in gradually over millions of years. You will be surprised, the human evolution is not a, a, a kind of, you know, overnight development, it has taken millions of years and at every stage there were certain clear kinds of processes and uh, factors that were operating. The human being was getting adapted to the conditions that were coming up and uh, challenging him or her, right? And uh, everything comes under the rubric called evolution. So, it has actually, we have evolved. We have evolved and we have emerged as humans. So, there are two clear words here. We have evolved and emerged. And uh, in that, we will see what are the various, uh, uh, small, uh, I can say, the finer elements. The finer elements here are, to, to speak uh, about this, the biological and cultural factors in human evolution, right. So, what exactly made us the person called we today? We are all, we are all, we all know that we are human, humans, human beings. Technically, we are called as Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens sapiens to be precise. And, uh, and um, what made the biological uh, being called human sapiens or Homo sapiens come into being? And what were the other stages before that? So, there were several stages. We have come from, a, as I said, pre-human to proto-human to human. This, this terminology is not there in any book, but uh, recently I have coined this. Uh, very soon, you will be getting uh, tips on that, how to how to un present yourself very uniquely in the exam by using kind uh, ideas like this. Okay, so we will be covering the biological factors behind the human evolution. And as I said, a human being is not just a biological being. Today you say we are all right, we are all uh, highly evolved. We are different from other animals. Correct. So when we compare ourselves with other animals. We say that we are human beings, we do not call other animals as animal beings, right? So, we do not call other animals as animal beings. So, why they are not animal beings, it is a different question, I will uh, uh, deal with that question later. So, since we are human beings, we know that we exist and we know that we have a culture, we know that we have developed a culture, we have to know that where this culture has developed. What do you mean by this culture? Is this culture the culture we are speaking that about now, today? The culture they say, right, the Western culture, Indian culture, South Indian culture, Na North Indian culture. Is that culture we are speaking about or is it something else? This here, let me tell you very clearly, the culture just now I have mentioned is not the culture I am actually supposed to do. The act, the original, the, the act, the first trappings of culture evolved when humans started making tools, the tools were made by humans. To, uh, earlier humans were using the tools, were already available, all the small pebbles and stones which were already cut by natural forces, they were uh, having those rough edges or small like boulders and small pebbles, they used to chop and cut everything. They were using the tools, but at some point of time humans started making tools. So, this has actually revolutionized the way humans lived on this planet. Earlier, we were only the biological beings. Now, we are biological plus cultural beings. So, that is the reason we have to learn the biological factors first, then the cultural factors. So, what do you mean by these cultural factors? The cultural factors like, right, the language, uh, then the use of fire, use of clothing, food, cooking and every all other uh, paraphernalia. and uh, the, how they have uh, helped us adapt to certain extreme climates. So, all these are the factors which helped us in human evolution. So, like that we will go thread by thread bear and we will also touch upon the theories of organic evolution, how Darwin left his imprint on the scientific community, scientific world 
in general and biology in particular and for anthropology it's a it's a great starting point that's the reason i start my discussions with darwin's theories because darwin has started questioning the established myths whatever the myths that were available those days uh, doing the rounds those days yes yes uh, you know challenge them and attack them he was some someone like a cataclysmic person so he, he attacked them the notion that the the human being was created in certain four days so i mean scientific community could not accept that but science wants proof and darwin has given that proof so what exactly is that and uh, what were the other ideas uh, existing before darwin they were called pre darwinian if you see here syllabus clearly pre darwinian post darwinian and uh, in the middle the darwinian so this becomes the central idea and uh, this uh, these areas are regularly being asked in the exam recently they, they have asked about uh, right the synthetic theory of evolution and uh, which comes later and uh, these are all highly scoring areas let me tell you very very easy actually terminology wise they look uh, to non biology students a bit tougher but once we get going i'll brief you uh, on every single word every single word we will stop and uh, open that the meaning the contextual meaning and the real meaning the applied part of the meaning the the meaning that you should convey to the examiner the meaning the examiner uh, is asking for you to you know um, deliver so we'll go in again in that 360 degree approach and uh, let me let me give you some ideas very clearly okay these are the other concepts we'll tell uh, speak about but um, i want to say something to you very honestly in the beginning right and uh, i am a person who usually start with giving promises very interesting right very few people do this i i start giving promises of course not empty you will see that majority of the promise all the promises are delivered so what are the promises i want to give is one you will first of all uh, the myth that anthropology is not amenable to non biological students so anthropology is not a myth is that anthro is not suitable to non biology students so it is as i said it is a myth which has to be debunked i will debunk that i will see to it that it is made easy it is simplified demystified whatever you call it. this myth is gone because anthropology is the easiest subject that you can actually enjoy many of my students are engineers they come from non biological backgrounds they are commerce students they are engineers they are statisticians textile engineers pharma students and tell you what every one kind of a person of from different educational backgrounds are enjoying anthropology today right it is a easy subject provided we spend the time first on the focus on the essentials and basics first next the another one i'll say is you will get the basics strong your basics will be absolutely strong like rock solid foundations i'll give next the third one you will have is clarity what clarity what is the importance of clarity and i i uh, speak to students saying that clarity is the essential thing in communication no clarity no communication as simple as that so in the exam hall you are going to communicate to the examiner right your answer scripts your sheets your diagrams your way of uh, writing expression everything you are communicating with that person it's not that you are writing answers no please come out of this uh, this thing right assumption you are not writing answers in fact you are communicating with the other person we you have you have not seen at all so to do you have to make double sure that your your communication skills are absolutely brilliant so for that what is the essential thing needed clarity the base base word here is clarity and where will you have where you should have clarity you should have clarity in the concepts 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 laden with terminology 
concepts which are based in root words okay so you should be very very strongly grounded grounded in the root words the basics the applied knowledge the applied part and of course the current developments and the what we say is right the current affairs part of the anthropology i call it as current developments which very many a times impinge uh, they hit back into the core of the subject so you should be strong in the core subject that is a basic part of the subject and when you know strongly the basic part of the subject your your current knowledge will easily fit right it's not that many students ask me sir what kind of uh, the current uh, uh, component is there how how much current uh, affairs is there in anthropology i said i uh, i told to, uh, tell them that don't worry first of all you become strong in the basics because this is an optional this is not first of all any gs subject so you have to become strong in the basics your core content is almost more than 80% or sometimes even 90% in the exam so you have to worry only about 10 to 20% at the most very rarely 30% of the current rarely extremely rarely so i don't think uh, the examiners will ask 30% of your questions from the current uh, anthro absolutely no because this is optional this is not gs and the applied part will naturally take care of the current stuff so this is another promise i'm going to give you first i the promise is anthropology is easily uh, right digested by even the non biology students it is not the ball game of biology students there are so many areas which as i said there are there are areas like anthropological thought theories there is a uh, social cultural area called marriage uh, family kinship etc which anybody can easily understand then the third one is archaeological anthropology then there is tribal india then indian society like varna system caste system indian village system and all these are easily understandable by everyone the physical part is a one which eats the it's the you know uh, the, the the gets the attention of the people that that is the scary part people say no it the, the physical part comes for only about 40 to 50 marks at the most 80 marks but rest of the 250 marks in the paper 1 right well, if you see even uh, at the highest 80 marks if you remove out of 250 about 120 plus 50 about 170 sorry 120 marks are still there for other parts and paper 2 entirely 250 marks non biology so why why fear biology no it's ag again it's 10th class biology only nothing like you are you, you are not supposed to be a doctor or a geneticist to understand physical anthropology yes the terminologies will be there one or two terminologies or terms will be difficult for you initially but over a period of time i said my promises i'll deliver the clarity in each and every term that we are going to use okay so let's let's go to the next one i'll i'll give you some more insights while we travel in that so many ideas come i feel that you are already interacting with me i am i my classes uh, go in this yeah interact interactive based so the promise that it's not a promise actually it's my nature i feel that you are in front of me and uh, at any point of time you will never never realize that you are actually saying recorded class absolutely no so because i raise so many questions i answer the questions on behalf of you i i uh, anticipate the questions you are going to ask and even if I, even if i miss some right rarely if that happens you can always approach me in that live sessions which are coming up at every week or so right after every test we conduct i'll conduct the live sessions with you guys you can speak to me directly and get your doubts clarified as well as uh, getting uh, the knowledge on the answers and the correction chalo then we'll go to the next slide so in chapter 1.5 we'll deal with primates we deal with primates because they are we are a part of the primate family so humans are basically primates okay so primates means first in the order in the in the entire classification of the animal kingdom carolus linnaeus the father of taxonomy has put humans at the top of the evolutionary ladder though he very interestingly opposed evolution 
and evolutionary theories. But uh, if you see his, his uh, classification, he put humans at the top and he has put humans in a group called primates, the order called primates, it is called order, primate order. In the classification we have right, uh, uh, animal kingdom, the phylum, then, uh, then the class, then order like that. There are several taxa or groups in that humans belong to a group called primates and alongside humans. We have our ape cousins, the chimpanzees, gorillas, then orangutans, gibbons, siamangs on the one hand, which are called anthropoids and there are some other animals like lemurs, lorises, tarsiers, which all are called as prosimians. So, we have two types of broad divisions in primates. So, we will try to enjoy this. This is a thoroughly enjoyable area, which you will actually love while we going, uh, while we go through. It looks slightly abstract in the initial stages in the introduction, but we will know what are, are our roots as I said and we see how we are also, we also share some characteristic features of the uh, primates and uh, we will have a look at the primate taxonomy, their adaptations, uh, some typical uh, behavior by these uh, primates, especially certain scholars have done research, especially uh, women scholars like Jane Goodall, you might have noticed her in your uh, National Geographic uh, channel, right? Certain documentaries are there. If you type Jane Goodall, you will know. She has dedicated her entire life to the study of chimpanzees. There was another uh, lady called Diane Fossey. She has actually uh, sacrificed her life for the cause of protection of the mountain gorillas in Africa. So, these uh, two ladies have, have supplied a huge information on primate behavior. So, if they and uh, why we have to focus this primate behavior, we have a clue, a very interesting question, you know, right? You raise your doubts, right? And uh, you, you st uh, save those doubts for me. And I will also ask some questions in between. I will ask you to stop the video and again uh, raise the question, come back as if you are directly interacting. And again, I will uh, continue from where I have left, okay? So, we will have a very interesting question as to why we have to study all this primate taxonomy, primate adaptations and evolutionary trend and characteristics of primates, primate behavior and wa what are these uh, unique terms. First time perhaps you are seeing this tertiary, tertiary and quaternary fossil primates and uh, living major primates. These are the two, two new terminologies. I said new terminologies wherever you come across, do not get scared. It is a easy ball game. Once it is made out, you will really enjoy it and play with it. And today, we are, there are some living major primates like us, humans and uh, chimpanzees, monkeys, gorillas, apes, all are called as apes, right. We will be having a look at them. And last but not the least, these two are being regularly asked in the exam. We have to compare ourselves, we will compare ourselves with uh, the other primates, especially the uh, close cousins like we call them as cousins because we you will know why I am calling them as cousins, you will realize in a while. So, especially chimpanzee, gorilla, orangutan, these three are mainly comp compared for the skeletal modifications and muscular modifications which led to the erect posture and bipedalism, some, something extraordinary that has happened in human evolution. I am using this word again, extraordinary something extraordinary happened in human line of evolution, which uh, established uh, humans as humans, which made us uh, different uh, from the other apes and other anthropoids, other primates and other animals. See, that is the reason we go back. Today, you just mark my words, just uh, focus on this, stop the video for a second and uh, uh, focus on this question. I will be spending on this question again when I go to that chapter, particular chapter, why I am saying we and the, we and the apes like gorilla, chimpanzee, etc. and other apes which are called anthropoids and other, other uh, primates like prosimians and other mammals and other animals. So, that is how we are divided and classified in the animal kingdom, okay. So, having said that, so in the next slide, we will know what exactly is the way we have developed. In the sense, we had our uh, hominid ancestors. We are actually called as hominids. 
in earlier i was saying you know in primates in the earlier uh, uh, slide we said we are all primates right in primates we say we are very close to this apes man and apes both man and apes are collectively called as hominoids so i'm slightly adding one or two terms now in the very introduction don't get scared so the, we are collectively we called as hominoids so i'm underlining the key key word here hominoid be very clear here noid n o i d this is n o i d so from chapter 1 1.5 to chapter 1.6 we will evolve that what is that evolution here this evolution is simple hominoid to hominid so what is see here the spelling is now n i d earlier it was n o i d only small even if you if you write that spelling mistake no your marks will be cut so very be very clear there is a difference between hominoids and hominids and when we say the word hominids that means hominids includes only humans only humans homo sapiens and other uh, earlier forms of homo, homo sapiens what are the other uh, forms of uh, i mean ancestors of homo sapiens these are the ones australopithecus right from the australopithecines and homo erectus then it was also called as paranthropus in a different sense i'll come to that in a detail and uh, homo erectus in different parts of the world then we had got a great stage of uh, human uh, ancestors called neanderthal man then rhodesian man and uh, last but not the least this is the key word i said homo sapiens in that we have got several parts several types called cro-magnon grimaldi and chancellate so these three types of humans uh, is the last thing that happened in the human line and today we are like this only we don't know my students regularly ask me sir are we still evolving that's a brilliant question they ask first the most of the students ask me is are we still evolving i said yes we are evolving but uh, we we can't say that okay see this is the stage this was earlier homo sapiens then we are something else we think this has not come yet maybe in a few uh, thousands of years or lakhs of years we may evolve into a different type but presently we are still homo sapiens we are evolving but perhaps perhaps our evolutionary speed has got lot slowed down because we have evolved in a different line so again mark my words stop this video and raise a question what is this different line of evolution i am speaking about i will answer that in the actual chapter so let's go to the next one the next uh, thing is the basic that thing that you should have the basic uh, idea about uh, the cell biology whatever that you have noted in your 10th class or 9th class school biology only and how it is important to chapter 9 so we have got several uh, related topics chapter 9.1 to 9.8 then chapter 10 11 and 12 plus this 1.4 1.5 1.6 okay again i repeat 1.4 1.5 1.6 1.7 1 and 9 from 9 to 9 10 11, 11 and 12 all or of these chapters together are called biological anthropology or physical anthropology okay so for this to these topics to I mean, especially these areas to for you to understand better we need to have some basic ideas about what is a cell what is dna what happens inside the cell what is nucleus what is protein synthesis what is what are ribosomes what are mitochondria and several other words would be come across what is mitosis and meiosis cell division is of two types what is mitosis and meiosis and how they Uh, play their role in the transmission of hereditary characters something very clearly we we have to understand and this is something like you know based to the physical anthropology so without understanding this you will be uh, in a difficult position to understand the other terms coming up in the biological or physical anthropology and uh, let me clearly say here in the very beginning that uh, 
uh, the very biological thing which scares the some people, not everyone, that okay, anthropology means biology, usko padna hai, then I say no, you have to really you will get extraordinary marks. This is a highly scoring marks. I can say even the highest scoring area or highly scoring area in the anthropology paper. So, if that is uh, the prospect, why will I leave my students in the fear complex? No, I will take you out of that and I will give you the ideas to score the maximum to something where you can even score up to 90 percent. There is a chance this area can give you the marks I can guarantee that you will get 90 percent provided you hit in the on the right uh, areas. Okay. So, this is a basis this this chapter 1.7 is a basis for understanding the earlier parts 1.4, 1.5, 1.6 to some extent and in the maximum extent in understanding the other uh, parts of physical or biological anthropology. Okay. So, guys uh, the next chapter is 1.8 in your paper 1 which requires you to understand prehistoric archaeology that is the part which uh, we have uh, spoken about in 1.3. See if you just remember in 1.3 there are four sub disciplines of anthropology right you remember. So, in that one was archaeological anthropology one is the first one is social cultural anthropology second was biological anthropology third one was archaeological anthropology and the fourth one was uh, uh, linguistic anthropology just check with your syllabus and I want you to everyone please have a copy printed copy of the syllabus ready with you. So, that while you undergo the classes I will be regularly referring to that particular topic and chapter number also. So, that you get a feeling initially you see it is like confusing so many topics are there, but eventually you will uh, uh, see see that uh, it is all linked highly highly integrated. So, every small topic in this extraordinary subject called anthropology is highly integrated. So, when you know the topic numbers and the chapter numbers they will be crisscrossing. crossing will be coming uh, forth coming back and that is the reason I said 1.8 when you are studying the subject title is prehistoric archaeology, but ar actually it is also linked to uh, the sub subdivision called archaeological anthropology in 1.3. Okay. So, this is one. So, under this prehistoric archaeology we will be studying these ideas, we will be speaking about principles of prehistoric archaeology and that is chronology, one is chronology that and in that we will be talking about relative and absolute dating methods okay. and also various stages of human cultural evolution. I have raised this one question earlier you remember. So, there is this one line, one line of evolution which which made us somewhat slow down in the entire uh, journey correct. So, what is this slowing down uh, as I said one student asked me sir whether we have we are still evolving or whether we have stopped evolving. The answer is exactly it is partly yes, it is partly no, partly yes because uh, we have started moving in this cultural evolution line. So, what is this cultural evolution? Earlier we were speaking about in 1.4, 1.5, 1.6 biological evolution okay? because human was evolving, humans were evolving from pre-human to proto-human to human stage right from Australopithecus to Homo erectus to Neanderthal man to Homo sapiens. So, that was all the biological part, but here in this we will be speaking about the cultural evolution of humans. So, what is this cultural evolution? So, as I said the word culture here we are using is not the word culture you and me know as a ordinary person. The culture you say right, I say that Punjabi culture, East Northeastern Indian culture, South Indian culture, Tamil culture, Telugu culture, Kannada culture, not that culture or uh, I mean Western culture, non-Western culture festivals, food and dressing. No, this is not the culture we are speaking about. We are speaking about the word culture which made humans from animals. Earlier we were as I said we were like 
animals. Today also we are animals, but we are cultured animals or cultural animals, social animals. But earlier, about about almost like two million years ago, okay, two million years ago, we were only natural animals. But once we have done something very interesting, we have become right. We have become cultural beings. We have become cultural animals. So that that the that, that that the point where we have started becoming cultural animals is nothing but the starting point of the cultural evolution so what is that cultural evolution because it all started with something called as lithic 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 means stone all are stone involving stones lithic means stones what is the stone doing here the stone doing here is something you know getting transformed into stone tools there are of course other tools, bone tools, etc. But stone is a key raw material which made the human today as we are existing like this, the cultural being. Because without the stone being manipulated for human purpose, the different purposes being served, that is we can't even imagine where would have we been, right? It's unthinkable. So this cultural evolution started with stone tools humans started making tools and there were clear stages, stage by stage humans evolved from Paleolithic to Mesolithic to Neolithic. Then we have started entering into the Chalcolithic, here it is Chalco plus Lithic, that means copper plus stone. First time humans started using metals, right? And from there still some stones were being used. So copper plus both stones were used. So that's the reason we call it as Chalcolithic. The metal age started here. So we started using metals for the first time. Then uh, copper transformed into bronze with some metallurgical technique. Then of course iron is the ultimate culmination. So the cultural stages of humans culminated in the iron age. So iron age, bronze age, all these are the key stages in human cultural evolution. And we, achha, then how do you say all these are different stages? We have certain techniques, we have certain ideas with which we determine, okay, this is the cutoff point, this is the age. For example, Paleolithic started at about 2 million or 2.5 million years ago. So how do we know that this is 2.5 million years ago only? For example, if we find certain, uh, certain stone tool, certain other bone tool or some other artifact, some copper vessel or some pottery, then how do you know that it belongs to this age? This is the, its uh, antiquity, this much time, 1000, 10,000 years old, 15,000 years old, 1 lakh years old, 1 million years old. How can you know that? You know all that with these principles. What are these principles? Pre principles of dating. There are certain things called dating methods, not the dating methods you and I know without the idea of uh, anthropology, but the, the, the uh, techniques and methods which assign some date or some time to certain, certain uh, finding, these are, these are called as artifacts, artifacts and fossils, okay. Artifacts and fossils means then uh, there are some things made by the humans, for example, artifacts include pottery, okay pottery, then fossils means our bone material, our bone, uh, the jaws, etc., bone fragments. So whenever we, the archaeologists and anthropologists, especially archaeological anthropologists, dig out something, excavate something from the earth, they, the first question they have before them is taking the date, coming to exact date of that. So that is a key here. We date this idea, this this uh, uh, this uh, entire thing, right? In a in a two way. One is relative and uh, absolute dating methods. What are exactly them? We will know in a in the future. Next, coming to the next topic, that is chapter two. We start from chapter two into a a, a new topic, new area. This this area we start. We say is a starting point of social cultural anthropology
Now, you will really un enjoy this area extraordinarily, because in this, in this area, say chapter 2, we will discover that there are societies in this world, which are unique, which have their, you know, cultural practices very different from us. First of all, this, this very world is a huge variety, right? It is a, it's a kind of a rainbow. I call the entire human creation, this different societies, different cultures, languages around the world, is like a rainbow. So, everything, every rainbow starts from some, you know, white light. If it is split into the, you know, prism, then the prism spreads all this into seven rainbow colors. So, if you see, we have all the common origins, we are homo sapiens, we are basically cultural beings, that is that white light. But when we put them under this scanner called anthropology, when this, when they spread out, we have different, different colors of life in the different marriage practices, different family uh, patterns, different structures. We have different practices of uh, what you call kinship patterns. We have different economic practices, different political systems, religion. So much variety is there in this world. That is the reason this chapter is thoroughly enjoyable, extraordinarily interesting. But uh, before going into the uh, the further topics that is 2.3, 2.4, 2.5, 3, 4, 5 and 6. Then first uh, basic basic theoretical constructs, theoretical ideas we have to know that is in the nature of culture and nature of society, we, we will definitely know what exactly is the word culture. Because as I said in the beginning, in the very beginning I said anthropology is also the study of cultures. Anthropology is the study of societies. So, in chapter 2.1, we will study about the nature of culture and how the culture uh, the, has, has also related to the concept of civilization. What exactly is civilization? What exactly is culture? And what is, what are these very interesting new terms? Again, there are new terms here, ethnocentrism and cultural relativism. What are these two terms? We will know in detail. Okay. At this time, point of time, they look slightly abstract, but when we move forward, you will realize, we will come back to this in detail, what exactly is this cultural relativism. But there are further more interesting topics, that is uh, in terms of this topic, that is nature of society, where as I said, anthropology is the study of societies, what exactly is the society and how society and cultural are related to each other. What are the social institutions like uh, marriage, like social institutions like you know social groups and social stratification? These are the key areas which are being asked of late also. Okay, and uh, once uh, once you know the other topics, for example, family, marriage, and others, then you'll know the abstractness of this or the simple uh, the explanation of this. Next is marriage. From here, we begin this interesting journey. There is, uh, there are um, ideas called marriage, family, kinship, which are all together. 2.3 marriage, 2.4 family, 2.5 is uh, kinship. So, all the three have to be studied together. First, we will study them separately, right? Then we will see the linkages, how 2.3, 2.4 and 2.4 related and how they are also related to chapter 3, chapter 4 and chapter 5. Because chapter 3 deals with economic organization, chapter 4 deals with political organization, chapter 5 uh, deals with religion. So, till chapter uh, 5, all is a single kind of monolith. But for our purposes, initially, we will study them separately. Then, while going into the deeper uh, dimensions, I will see, I will show you the linkages. Okay? So, in marriage, you will see what kind of marriages we have. You must be knowing recently, lot of lot of things are happening in the society. Uh, for example, we have got uh, um, new cons new kind of concepts like live-in relationship. You all must be knowing, right? Live-in live-in uh, relationships, live-in marriages, and uh, lot of divorces are increasing in the society. And uh, the, the the concept of uh, elderly people are increasing. Old age homes are coming up crashes are increasing. So, your examiner is also asking you to think on these lines. Recently, there was a question is in 2020, they have asked 
uh, discuss the impact of feminist movement on the family structure and uh, the marriage. You see, here in marriage also there is, in marriage and also in the next chapter, if you see, in family we have concept of feminization, impact of uh, you know feminist movements on family. And I just now told you family, marriage are all related. Without marriage, no family, no family, no marriage, right? Since they are all related, so in 2020, they have raised a question, they have asked a question asking you to focus on the changes that have come in the family structure and the marriage definition. So, what exactly are that? We will know when we focus on the definition of marriage. What exactly is a marriage? Is that gay marriage or that live-in relationship is also marriage or not a marriage? Does that fit anthropological uh, perspectives? We all will be very interestingly waiting for that, right? I, I know you are very eager on that. So, in that we will also come across in, in uh, specific to certain uh, terms, especially terms like endogamy, exogamy, hypergamy, hypogamy, incest taboo, core anthropological terms. These are core anthropological terms and nothing to scare, they are very, very easy. Let me tell you, they are very easy topics. We have also certain diagrams for this, scope for diagrams, simple diagrams which will actually reward you a lot. This is also very highly scoring area. And uh, in this uh, 2.3 topic marriage, we will also be speaking about the types of marriage, different types of marriages like monogamy, polygamy, right, and uh, polyandry, group marriage, functions of marriage, all are highly, highly scoring and highly interesting. And what are the different uh, rules and regulations that operate on marriage? There are certain types called preferential marriages, prescriptive marriages and proscriptive marriages. So, preferential means you have certain, you have some people already, you prefer someone. Your society asks you to marry some people, right? Similarly, prescriptive, you, your society says, okay, you can marry here. Then some, the society says, no, you can't marry here or this people. That is called proscriptive, no, you cannot marry. So, societies every, everywhere across the world, in the world, they have certain rules and regulations. You have to marry these people. You can marry these people, you cannot marry these people. So, there are clear kinds of marriage regulations and anthropologists are highly interested in them. Because as I just now told you, in this entire world, because of the, the nature of this world is like a rainbow, no color is same, no society has got the same type of marriage. Okay, the universal, there are universal types of marriages, but there are so many societies which do not fit in this definition which have got lot of uniqueness, lot of variety. So, anthropologists are always interested in these varieties. So, marriages usually you all know, they do not go without any payment. There are payments, there are exchange mechanisms, people involve money also along with the girl and the boy, right. And in anthropology, there are very interesting thing, which is seen in the simple societies like tribal people, tribal India and other parts of the world, they have something called as bride wealth, also known as bride price, where the girl gets some money in the marriage, not like our societies, where we have got dowry system, the boy gets the girl plus also some money and wealth. So, instead in the simple societies, the girl gets some money for getting married. So, that is a beauty, right? And in some areas, this is still being practiced and it is a uh, area of interest for anthropologists again. And uh, let me tell you what, the beauty of anthropologists, whatever that happens in the world is like wow to anthropologists. Anthropologists show that childlike enthusiasm. They are, they are like, they are the first people to get interest in that. They just jump into that area. Anything unique to humans, because, any, because anthropology is a subject of our own study, right? We study our own uh, body our own origins and evolution, our own marriage systems, our own culture, our own language, our own uh, applied part, our problems. So, I mean, then naturally anthropologists are the ones 
to first jump into that area and eager to learn that area with all with all that interest in the world so even small any small uh, interesting thing that they come across their documents so one such beautiful thing that happens in in simple societies is bride wealth and definitely they will also uh, consider the other part of the world called dowry in in other parts of the world this uh, the marriage payment is in the form of dowry so they will also study this so this is a regular part of marriage this marriage entire topic is uh, as i said uh, um, i mean contains all these dimensions coming to the next topic that is family as i just now mentioned marriage and family without go uh, they go hand in hand without marriage there is no family without family no marriage and both are intricately woven because it involves men women children their obligations their their roles and their statuses their their the love the bonding the economic obligation and so many things but anthropology again sees the same phenomena in a different way and you may be no, uh, saying sir um uh, we all know fine we all know marriage we all know family we are also living in this society we have uh, our own family we have we have joint families we have nuclear families marriages are very important for us right lifetime events we celebrate marriage we celebrate birth of the children so what is new here right you might be questioning that so anthropology says yes fine it's all correct you all know wonderful but the society has to be studied also in a systematic manner like a science just like a science studies something with principles with some models theories explanations applications same thing happens to society also because society is also like an organism there was a great scholar called uh, our uh, uh, this this person spencer herbert spencer he has compared the society to an organism just like an organism has different parts it uh, takes up it has some structures it has some functions similarly society also has some structures society has functions just like a organism has got some problems society has got some problems just like you study an organism you also study a society so society should be studied and marriage family kinship economic uh, uh, organization everything is studyable i mean i said readable uh, researchable so it's like ever growing area it is ever enthusiastic area it is not a drab and dull study many people miss in their school college days because it has become fashionable for us right to ignore social studies and people are ah, social agya then okay that that it is not scoreable that kind of a feeling is there in the students many students prefer for engineering and other um, i mean uh, popular courses it's okay fine that's that's how society moves but these these days the parents are also real, realizing that their that their children should know their society they should get connected to the society and civil services examination is one such opportunity for you to get to get this connections with your society okay because you know in and out of your society you have to know your society you have to maintain the linkages with your society because you are going to help that society to evolve develop structure and grow and uh, deliver at wherever the uh, they know society needs the help to itself the society has to deliver so unless we have got youngsters with the knowledge of the society the marriage patterns the family structures the importance of family then the world will be a better place to live so why i am saying this you will understand because there are so many things which are impacting our families that's the reason i said in 2020 they have asked a question Do you do you see the feminist movement at, uh, having any impact? What is the impact the feminist movement? You know feminist movement, right? Women's rights. There is a lot of quest for women's rights, and how women's rights quest and feminist movements have impacted the structure of the family, and also the marriage definition. And uh, there are so many things which are not discussed here, not mentioned here, but part and parcel of this topic. but before understanding this this the current stuff we have to know the core area this is a core area this is the 
base this is a base we should know which is purely anthropological stuff for example there is a term i will use here right the residence when when a couple marries right newly newly married couple goes and settles in a new home like mod, modern societies we are having it's called neo local residence so this is purely anthropological stuff so you have to know the general things and also the particular things so we will start from the particular then we'll go to the general because if we discuss directly if you know only this you can write a general answer but if you know this and you write this answer your answer becomes purely anthropological knowledge with a with a uh, with a what you call inroads into the current realities so you'll score in two fronts so this is another extraordinary interesting area family we will study in detail when it comes to that so another interesting thing that we learn in in paper 1 social cultural anthropology is kinship in chapter 2.5 kinship means simply relationship rather the reckoning of relationship that means you are using uh that 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 relationship to certain advantages this is the key area every everybody understands kinship as relationship fine we ha we all have relatives right we have relatives by birth we have relatives by by marriage so both these two types of relatives relatives make our life better so they are very very important in our life without them our life is incomplete everybody knows that but what is anthropology doing here in anthropology kinship is a key which where the 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 scholars have seen that kinship plays a vital role in all walks of life it's not just about any just relationship or attending some social gathering giving gifts and receiving gifts no it is beyond that kinship has got lot of application lot of help in a society kinship plays an important role in Uh, the economic organization they help each other they they it, it plays a part in political organization political structures kinship uh, makes uh, its uh, presence felt in uh, religion in so many uh, we we all have the, right these gatherings pujas we have got congregations where our our all uh, kith and kin come right so kinship plays a part in religion also so much it has got connections with all the types of uh the 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 life in the phases of life that's the reason we have to know what exactly is this kinship what are these different terms called consanguinity and affinity and what kind of principles that uh, go into informing this so there are several other uh, ideas we will learn in this kinship these are all new terms definitely you'll have to focus here uh, slightly initially you will feel there are new words but as we go on repeating i'll be repeating this several times wherever i discuss family also i'll discuss this i when i discuss economic organization also we'll discuss this topics so these terms will be regularly coming and uh, getting repeated from time to time so while we go into the, when we go into the actual topics we'll realize coming to the next topic is chapter 3 here chapter 2 ends all the key areas culture and society family marriage kinship is done so once we know the a bit of knowledge here we'll go to the next one called economic organization so anthropologists are interested in economic organization of the people also so what is the meaning here what is the idea here the idea here is not uh, about knowing the economic uh, lifestyle of the people in developed societies complex societies no like in india like in usa england but mostly we are interested in understanding the lifestyle of the people in tribal societies simple societies peasant societies which are very very simple their their operations are simple their bases are simple their their uh, methods are simple their techniques are simple so that's the reason i use the word simple societies very regularly simple societies theek hai so simple societies The, the to study the economic lifestyle of the simple societies is a key of economic anthropology this entire thing can also be understood as economic of economic anthropology or 
एंथ्रोपोलॉजी ऑफ इकोनॉमिक्स इकोनॉमिक एंथ्रोपोलॉजी और एंथ्रोपोलॉजी ऑफ इकोनॉमिक्स वेन बट वी हैव टू रिफ्रेन द वर्ड इकोनॉमिक्स हियर बिकॉज वी डोंट यूज द वर्ड इकोनॉमिक्स इन सिंपल सोसाइटीज बिकॉज इकोनॉमिक्स एज यू नो योर इट्स अ सब्जेक्ट राइट इन योर मे बी टेंथ क्लास इन योर इंटरमीडिएट ग्रेजुएशन यू माइट हैव स्टडीड दिस सब्जेक्ट इकोनॉमिक्स वेयर वी डिस्कस अबाउट द प्रोडक्शन डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन एक्सचेंज डिमांड सप्लाई एक्सेट्रा दिस दिस इज ऑल कॉल्ड फॉर्मल इकोनॉमिक्स अकॉर्डिंग टू एंथ्रोपोलॉजिस्ट वॉट दे से सर दिस इज ऑल ओनली फॉर्मल फॉर्मल मीन्स जस्ट लाइक फॉर्मल शर्ट एंड कैजुअल शर्ट और सिंपल सिंपल यूनिफॉर्म सिंपल ड्रेस फॉर्मल इकोनॉमिक्स आर नॉट एप्लीकेबल to simple societies because many many societies in this world are still living in hunting and gathering stage do you know fishing communities have you heard about the sentinelist recently one person uh, called jan chao i think 2016 or 2018 one one person from america about 24 year old person jan chao entered into the sentinelist islands and next day he was found dead in the boat with arrows on his body and uh, you know the sentinel no sentinelist person was arrested and sent to jail because sentinelists are the people only people in this world today who have got no contacts with outsiders the government of india and around the world anthropologists have suggested please leave them alone they are like the only isolated community i think according to my knowledge there is no society today which is completely isolated from the world so there are people even today living on hunting and gathering and sentinelists is that kind of people who are isolated and let me tell you what another example brilliant example is right in the heart of india the very south, south in south india in heart of uh, uh, you know telangana and andhra pradesh there is a community called chenchu maybe you have heard that chenchu community this chenchu community is still practicing hunting and gathering there is a community in in bihar jharkhand which is called birhor these people are also doing hunting and gathering there are some people called juangs so many people in the world there are someone called as eskimos or people in arctic north uh, you know arctic area in uh, uh the northern part of the world there are people called eskimos they are also hunting gathering and fishing people there are people in africa africa where we have got a community called as uh the bushmen bushmen of the kalahari deserts these people are also hunting and gathering even today they are living in hunting and gathering communities there are people who are living in fishing on fishing and hunting and gathering there are people doing pastoralism that means they they sell milk and milk products they uh, dairy products they rear cattle and sheep and goat they sell the meat and they are still living in this so it is not that society means only engineering and industrial economics and uh, agriculture no there are so many societies in this world which are still practicing this simple techniques of economic organization that means they live on on pastoralism their lifestyle is so simple some people practice horticulture they go garden crops some people practice shifting cultivation in your general studies you might have studied this right in geography you will come across this shifting cultivation shifting cultivation means they 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 cut uh, the part of certain area right a forest and they burn it and again after some time they put seeds on it then allow the crop to grow the rains are the uh, the, the only source of water for them they'll again take the crop leave it fallow for some time they go to another place so they go on shifting the places that's the reason it is called shifting cultivation it is even practiced today in the world in north east india it is still in vogue in central india it is there so shifting cultivation is still practiced and anthropologists are highly interested in studying what exactly are this what kind of people are there what kind of family structures they have 
do they have the same cultural practices so such an in interesting area right so such an brilliant area we never never know in the regular stuff then coming to the last topic but not the least topic that is globalization and economic systems and how globalization has impacted these simple societies have they changed or have they not changed if they have changed what kind of change that has come if they have not changed what are the uh, the, the traditional areas that are still there so like this we'll be uh, focusing on lot of areas of interest in this topic called economic organization and uh, coming to the next one political organization and social control so anthrop as i said social cultural anthropology contains this area also and uh, anthropologists are interested in studying these societies like simple societies as i said band tribe chiefdom kingdom and state uh, just now i said there is a commun there are there is a community called uh, eskimos eskimos bushmen in africa these people still live in this band community you know economically they are called as hunting and gathering communities and sometimes fishing also hunting hng means uh, hunting and gathering and they also add fishing to that so this kind of people live in a size small sized group called band which will not be more than uh, 50 or sometimes even 100 very small people they live and they move from one area to the other based on the rainfall based on the availability of the water based on the availability of the animals and the plants so they keep on you know moving from one place to other place they are highly nomadic people so these anthropologists are interested right from day one right from about 18th century 19th century because anthropology was basically developed in the western coming western countries it started from europe and they started understanding the, the visiting the new places in africa asia america australia then they they found new people which are completely different from their uh, lifestyle some of them never wore any clothes uh, they are uh, completely dark in color their hair is different their nose form is different their eyelids are different so they started you know curious getting curious as to what kind of people are this so anthropology actually started there the origin of anthropology is in meeting of two different cultures one is western culture and the other is non western culture such a beautiful area happened occasion happened about 2 300 years ago and now it is still growing even today these uh, societies are existing even today bands are studied even today anthropologists are studying tribes there are some chiefdoms existing today also there are ex kingdoms you know like saudi arabia uh, japan thailand we know that right we are studying that also and uh, yes we are a part of a complex society like india we are living in a uh, state called you know states united states america and india best example of a state society it's called state society kingdom society chiefdom society tribal society band society and uh, all are important for anthropologists right and how power authority and legitimacy are there in this and how people are controlling their uh, people in simple society especially this is a very key area in 2018 they have asked a question the nature of um, you know customs the importance of customs customary law in simple societies how customary law operates what is customary law very simple as you seen we when we go into the political uh, organization we focus on this area law how law and justice operate in in simple societies to bring about social control see the aim, ultimate aim is social control you have to control people correct people are not same all people are not peaceful they are not trouble makers right some people are trouble makers some people are not but trouble makers you know need to be controlled for that every society has got a norm Uh, some norms some some laws some customs but anthropologists again as i said are have brought to the notice of the world look there are so many people in this world which have got simple methods for example i'll give you a beautiful example earlier i have took the uh, uh, the example of this right eskimos eskimos 
who live in the Arctic area, this is in uh, North America beyond Canada, in uh, uh, this uh, even in America I think uh, what is the place called, um, is Alaska and beyond that extreme frigid areas, people live right, these people are Eskimos and they have a very interesting uh, uh, dispute uh, settlement mechanism. So, that is called song duel. Can you ever believe this? When somebody's wife uh, starts living with another person, okay. So, of course, it is a band society, very few people are there. They are not complex people like us. We do not, they have, do not have courts, laws, police, machinery, judges. They simply settle the matter with a song duel, right. They take part, you know, you also sing a song, I will sing a song. If you win, right, I just leave the matter. If you lose, my wife has to be returned. You return my wife, otherwise, chalo. This is, a, can you imagine, right? So, there are so many simple method, methods and mechanisms available with these people that they make their social control very easy. So, law is basically customary law. It is not a regular law like us. Many societies in this world do not have judges, courts, jails, police and all that arrest mechanism, civil procedure court, criminal procedure court, yes, they are very, very simple. They have a gathering of that people, they have, there are seniors, elders, they settle the matter easily. There are so many interesting areas in this, we will see and you really like, start liking anthropology. And let me tell you what, I was giving you some promises earlier. Another promise I am going to give that may be fifth promise that you will fall in love with anthropology. Very soon, you will fall in love in a, with anthropology and uh, you will really enjoy this subject. You will, you will be able to answer any type of question that may come across. He may give 20 marker, 15 marker, 10 marker, no problem. We will be helping you. I will also be giving you tips as to how, how to write the answers. I will give you the structure of the answers, how to uh, make the openings, introductions, how to write the conclusions, how to draw the diagrams what kind of diagrams should be avoided, what kind of drawings should be, you know, made to, uh, to enthusiasm examiner and so many things will be, uh, you know, coming, will be uh, dealing with in the coming uh, days. Well, going into the last part of this social cultural anthropology is religion, which is again of an extraordinary thing, which was right from day one scholars like E. B. Tyler, one of the founding fathers of anthropology, is called the father of modern anthropology. In Europe, Edward Brunet Taylor, this person also studied religion as to how religion originated in the first place. There are people who focused on what was the first form of religion. Now, just now I, we have noted, no, earlier who was our first ancestor, Australopithecus, Homo erectus, uh, then Neanderthal man, Homo sapiens, there are so many names you have come across, right? About 2 million years ago, about 1 lakh years ago, about 10 lakh years ago, uh, so uh, and uh, sometimes few thousands years ago, what kind of people were we? We were like mostly animals. In animal stage, can we imagine any religion to be performed or what kind of a first form of religion might have originated? What could have been the first form of religion? Is it animism? Is it fetishism? Is it animatism? Right? You see so many forms are there here. Different forms of religion are still there in this societies. In this world today, many people form, worship, uh, uh, you know, certain people, certain uh, gods and goddesses. One form is animism, one form is animatism, there are fetishisms, there is worship of nature, totemism, there, there are animals and birds which are worship. So, these scholars, especially some scholars, try to uh, explain how as to in uh, which as to in the first place religion originated. What could have been the first form of religion? Is it animism? Was it fetishism? Was it naturism? Or was it uh, worship of totem, totems? Totem means a small bird or animal which was worshipped as our ancestor. So, there are so many interesting things, there are ideas about souls and spirits. Uh, all that we studied by uh, Tyler and others. We will be also touching upon an area called religion and magic.
religion, magic and science, how science has now come about uh, today explaining the realities and how people uh, focused on uh, how, how they have relied on magic and religion earlier. There are certain interesting characters also they appear like you see in the movies right that bhut uh, man the something happens to the body and some soul comes there is one person who comes and takes out the, the spirit exorcist. So many interesting characters are there in our, in our discussion. There are people who do this sorcery and witchcraft. Even today in um, you know adjoining cities like Bengaluru, Hyderabad, if you just travel about 50, 100 kilometers in villages, even today there is something which is happening called witch hunting. Some people are hunted, taken out and they are beaten, they are sometimes killed also. So, they are, they are uh, doubted, this, these people are, there is something fishy here, they are doing some black magic. You know, some people died recently and we have found some nimbu, some haldi, right, all that in their backyard, these people are witches, these are black magicians and they have to be taught a lesson. Sometimes they are beaten up, they are killed also. There are so many cases, if you read the newspaper regularly, you will be coming across witch hunting happened recently. People are tied to the tree and beaten and uh, because they were, they were uh, doubted that they are practicing witchcraft. So, we will see what exactly is this witchcraft, sorcery, magic done by this interesting characters. Okay guys, so we will discuss uh, all this in detail in our topics. So, there is another interesting uh, topic here in uh, paper 1. Which is, which is extraordinary again in its own way and uh, let me tell you what it is highly scoring also. That, that part is a single topic called chapter 6 anthropological theories. So, in anthropological theories we will be knowing a great deal about how the scholars uh, saw the world in their own, in their own way. In the sense this world uh, of, of uh, the simple societies, the cultures, the tribal people, the peasant people, the complex societies and what, how the culture has actually been, um, I mean uh, originated in the first place and how it has evolved in a different way. There were theories actually given by the scholars, as I told you scholars like E. B. Tyler, Edward Burnett Tyler, E. B. Tyler who was called as the father of modern uh, ethnography in uh, Britain. He is a British scholar. Then there is another British scholar called Fraser, James George Fraser and one American scholar called Morgan. So, all these people have uh, subscribed to a theory called classical evolutionism. So, right from uh, classical evolutionism which emanated in 19th century till the 1980s where we have got concepts like postmodernism anthropologists have uh, been giving theories in perspective in as to how culture has to be viewed and how culture has evolved in the first place right and how culture has got, got some function how culture has diffused have culture how f culture has come to give some functional uh, importance to humans how Culture is uh, linked to human social structure, that is how society and culture are related. There are some scholars who have become pioneers of anthropology. As I said, these, these scholars are all called as pioneers of, you know, social cultural anthropology, who made a lot of contributions to the field. So, one of the contributions, uh, the area of the contributions is the theories. So, these theories uh, on the gen general look, it lo they look a bit uh, you know very unique and bland. So, dry, some, somewhat dry, it looks somewhat dry, but actually a lot of juice is there. When we go deeper, dig deeper, we have got ideas like structuralism where scholars like Levi Strauss say that there are everything happens in human mind. So, whatever we think, then it transforms into culture. We think in uh, day and night, hot and cold, good and bad, society also thinks like that. Society builds its language like that. Society builds its relationships like that. 
in uh, we and they etc there are beautiful ideas we'll like you'll be completely bowled over and how and all these ideas came to be used to study the society simple societies and also complex societies so there are some ideas which developed in the first part of the 20th century like culture and personality school which had a lot of psychology involved in them this is area called as psychological anthropology by some scholars psychological uh, dimensions were also involved how how culture and personality influence each other that means whether for example we are having certain indian personality right some kind of indian uh, personality we are peace loving people uh, we are basically soft people we do not uh, attack others we right in history we study that indians have not attacked any other nation but we have opened the doors for all the outsiders to come and attack us so are basically peace loving people panchashil hai ah shanti shanti bolte hain so so lot of lot of thing we have in common we have something called as indian culture indian thinking pattern uh, type of personality so the the people see that okay these people are all having this culture because these people have this kind of personality some people are aggressive some people are docile some people are in the middle so people started uh, classifying people in terms of psychological understanding psychology and personality are highly related so that's the reason culture and personality school also developed in america giving a new idea again there are ideas which developed in the 20th century right these are called as 20th century evolutionists this 20th century evolutionists supported the 19th century evolutionists that's the reason they are called as neo evolutionists uh, for example gordon v child leslie a white julian stewart marshall sahlins and elman servis all these great scholars have revisited the ideas given by tyler morgan and fraser in 19th century and gave new explanations saying that these people are all right but they they had whatever whatever gaps they have left we will explain so some new ideas uh, given by the people to improve upon this so classical evolutionism and neo evolutionism are highly integrated to each other and in anthropological theories one theory is uh, the result of another theory one theory is put forward by some scholar or scholars some all if there are several scholars are there together it is called a school for example it is called culture and personality school structuralism school functionalism school the school of symbolic and interpretive theories because it is not one scholar that it is uh the responsible for this knowledge there are several scholars who think in the same line and they contribute in their own way so all are them all of them are together called as school so these schools of thought developed as one uh, after the other as for example one school of thought has come another school of thought comes what is the relation between them one school of thought uh, says something the other school of thought, uh, thought says no you are wrong you are wrong and we are, so look this is how we have to put it and and these scholars were criticized these scholars came these scholars were criticized these scholars came like that every cultural school of thought is linked to each other so when we cover all the topics initially you will feel these are all different as i said just like any other uh, just like as i said in the beginning anthropology looks like a detailed uh, very big syllabus but when we complete each and every part we see that all are linked together highly organically so there is a beautiful organic linkages between all these theories it is only the smartness of with which we uh, with which we approach the subject then we realize the potential of this and i tell you again this is an extraordinarily scoring area there are students who have scored more than 80% here sometimes even uh, even 90% also you can score right i'll give you training on that how to score maximum in that but but uh, please go step by step understand each on the of the scholar first the concept again clarity uh, we add in the basics the terms the terminologies the explanations models diagrams then we link all of them together and we look say oh wow such a great experience we have then we will look forward when the exam will come
so that we'll write beautiful answers. This is how we go about in an integrated fashion. This area is also coming regularly for you uh, in the exam. Roughly about 30 to 40 marks are asked every year. 30 to 40 marks in paper one. So marks gather. You can score in as I said more than 80 percent. So in this area, so imagine how much you can get right every area every year minimum. This is minimum I'm saying. So we will uh, and uh, as usual I have a practice before I begin any uh, topic, any subject chapter. I go uh, the re previous year questions. I I just uh, put them list out and just give you an idea how these questions are coming and. Uh, all of all of the questions, most of the questions are directly from the syllabus. The beauty of anthropology, right, as a discipline, as a UPSC optional, highly scoring optional. You know why it became highly scoring optional? Scoring optional because most of the questions directly come from the syllabus. Syllabus question, syllabus question. I can just showcase to you. In the beginning of the topic, I will list all the questions. Then I will take you to the topic. Then at the end of the topic, again I will discuss each and every question. See look, now once you know the subject, right, once you completed the topics, you will be in a position to know, okay, these are the basic points. Then you will at the end of the topic connect easily, beautifully to the subject. Then sir, sir, okay, these are the points, you have to write this. And I will ask you, what are the points you have to write? You say these are the points. Yes, right, absolutely. And I will add some more points. Okay, sir, fine, fine. Then in the very class itself, you will get the confidence that I can write the exam easily. Anthropology is a easy subject, right? I will give you that confidence, another promise, sixth promise, okay, okay friends. So let us go forward into the next topic, that is chapter 7. Chapter 7, if you can now recollect, as I said, go back to 1.3, take the syllabus copy with you. Uh, in 1.3, again, there are major subdivisions of anthropology. In that, you see in the last, the first one is social cultural anthropology, second is biological or physical anthropology, third is archaeological anthropology, and fourth, it is listed is linguistic anthropology. And see, chapter 7 is directly linked to language. Language is nothing but, and how we are interested in this extraordinary area that area is called linguistic anthropology or anthropology of language. This is anthropology of language or linguistic anthropology and again you will see so many insights, new insights, you will really love this uh, topic because we will even see, we will go to the origin of language. When in this beautiful human evolution could this language have arisen? It is like, you know, as I said, it is an extraordinary curiosity. Anthropology is nothing but uh, knowing our own life. We are studying ourselves, right? Be, be, and this is an extraordinary subject where imagine if we compare with uh, other disciplines like engineering, economics, geography, physics, whatever, management, all study human life only in some part, correct? We deal only with some specialized aspect. But anthropology is the only discipline in entire sciences that we study all aspects of human life. So, one in the major, major, uh, you know, part comes the language, the linguistic anthropology, because without language, we cannot communicate and language is a big asset as well as a problem. Some many problems come with miscommunication, language uh, barriers, and many problems are solved with language. Right? Right? In in, in uh, I, I was uh, speaking. I'm, I'm trying to learn some new languages also these days so that I can relate to these people brilliantly. So uh, all the people and staff have have been brilliant, and they help me wherever I go, wherever I teach, and uh, immediately I get a new bonding with them. Why? Because I am a basically a person of open nature, I want to learn a language, that curiosity itself allows me to grab the words faster. So the understand this, this again I, I, I ask you to stop the video here and just focus on this question. What 
Now imagine earlier I said anthropology was born as a contact between non-western people and western people, right? Uh, no, western people, right? The western people while discovering the sea routes to the world, different parts of the world came into contact with the non-western people. Then how do you understand each other? That language is different, your language is different, so many dialects, so many parts in that land, so many uniqueness, you do not even understand anything. So, anthropologists, the pioneers of anthropologists earlier I have shown to you, have done a gr great deal that they have made it a point to learn the language of these people, the simple people, tribal people in Africa, Asia, Oceania, Australia, India, everywhere. So, see the beauty of that language is the key thing. So, linguistic anthropology focuses on the language of the people. Every society has got some unique language and, and language is highly linked to the culture and language is linked to the communication and that is the reason we are interested in this beautiful area, right. And uh, we will go back to as I said what kind of nature of uh, uh, the language is here and how it originated and what are its characteristics features and what is the difference between verbal and non-verbal communication. Recently also they have asked about non-verbal communication, 2020 they have asked, right. Social context of language use, regular, regularly repeated stuff. You know, very interesting thing I just want to share with you. Do you speak the same language with your, uh, the language with, if you use with your friends to your strangers, to your elders? children on an occasion when you are called onto the dais, when you go to the UPSC interview, will you speak in the same way like your friends? No, right? The context changes and that is the reason we say there is a social context of language use. Social context, that means based on the part of the society you are dealing with, whether you are speaking to women, whether you are speaking to friends, if you are speaking to elders or a strangers, will your language be the same? No, there are so many intricate things, so many things which we use in language that anthropologists are always interested in friends. So, that is how this is area, again this is an interesting area and I am telling you in every chapter your increase, your interest goes on increasing like, like bank interest, right? you will be accumulating when you give a loan or take loan lot of interest is accumulated. So, I am promising another thing, another promise, maybe sixth or seventh, I do not know. Your interest in the discipline increases with each chapter, okay. So, linguistic anthropology is one such area where it is highly scoring as well as interesting also. Now, coming to the another key area of uh, anthropology, because we have to say something here, right. This is basically a field discipline, anthropology is a basically field discipline, because without under doing field work, we cannot understand the society. So, people have to stay there, unlike any other uh, subject, for example, economist, if you get go to a village, they want to do survey as to whether subsidies are coming on time or not, whether insur crop insurance is coming or on time or not, or how much production, productivity. Economists have gone or management students have gone or sociologists have gone, they stay only for one way or two days, maximum one week and come back. But in anthropology, people stay for months together, sometimes years together. Why? Because they want to study the society in 360 degrees as I said, holistic discipline. Anthropology is a holistic discipline friends and for that field work is compulsory. And le let me tell you what, anthropology is a field based discipline. I repeat, what is anthropology? Another definition of anthropology, anthropology is a field discipline or field originated discipline, because field is its laboratory. Everything the anthropologist does is, uh, is emanating from the field, it has origins from the field. So, there are other ideas we learn in this field, how what kind of different techniques they use different methods and methodologies they follow and what kind of tools or techniques they follow in collecting the data from these people. They do some interviews, they observe, observe the people, they have schedules and questionnaires. These are all short notes stuff and uh, they collect lot of information from all the people in different methods because same method cannot be used for 
uh, I mean every every other occasion or every other person. So the uh, scholars change their techniques based on the context. They use one thing. Sometimes they use all. So these are the techniques of data collection. Once the data is uh, done, it is actually analyzed, it is interpreted, and it is presented to the public. It is presented in the form of monologues, diaries, this uh, uh, mon monographs, etc. Usually, the the product is known as monograph. When you go and visit, for example, Chenchus, and you write a small description, maybe hundred pages, you publish that, people accept you. Then it is called as monograph, Chenchu monograph. Okay, so many new terms I'll use in the journey, but presently this is how. So anthropology has got a lot of bearing on the research, and its research methods are unique. Let me tell you what: it is different from sociology, it is different from sciences, it is different from uh, commerce or economics or management, jo bhi hai. all these are completely different, but anthropology has, uh, that, that is the reason we say anthropology has got its own unique way of dealing with the things. What is that dealing with the things? Data collection, most important area is data collection, only then you can say, okay, these people are like this, these people are living like this, these people may require this, uh, this uh, areas, this, these are the problems of these people. And so the governments have to take care of this like this. So many things are dependent on this data. So anthropologists are even today highly relevant. They are hired by the governments. They are given uh, importance by the governments. Some multinational companies are appointing them. They are paid uh, consultancy charges. They are paid salaries. They are their research is very important. So anthropology is a highly relevant discipline, friends. So this is one idea. Then we will go to the next topic from where we will start the physical anthropology. As I said earlier, the physical or biological anthropology as you have mentioned earlier, right, consists of chapter 1.4, 1.5, 1.6, 1.7 1 and coming to again uh, uh, here in the in chapters from 9 to chapter 12. So, this is pure and core physical or biological anthropology. This starts from human genetics and what kind of methods are applied here, methods and applications. There were some traditional methods like earlier uh, 19th century methods, 20th century methods and uh, all this 20th century methods as well as um, I mean here today it is like 20th and 20th, 21st centuries, 20th and 21st century techniques. You all know about the COVID uh, vaccines, right? Today, so today we are uh, most of you might have got already vaccinated, right? So naturally, it's a curiosity how these uh, vaccines are manufactured. The knowledge is based on the DNA technology, friends, and uh, we are highly interested in that. DNA technology is regularly being asked in the exam. It's a highly scoring area. One such technique is recombinant technology. Acha, have you have you read the newspaper recently about three days back? Yeah, I heard that Zydus Zydus Cadilla company has introduced a new new I mean vaccine for children between uh, uh, eight and or uh, sixteen I think eight and eighteen or nine and eighteen. So whatever it may be the bracket for children, there is a you know vaccine that is coming up given by this company called Zydus Cadilla. And uh, you know what was that uh, in important thing here? It is a DNA based vaccine. This technology behind this vaccine is DNA. And uh, you know what is this uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus? That is that coronavirus we call popularly. Official name is SARS-CoV-2 virus. That SARS-CoV-2 virus is basically an RNA virus. It is called RNA virus. And uh, we will uh, def definitely uh, would like to understand what is this DNA RNA business, what is happening, uh, and uh, also we know about this RT PCR technique, right? Reverse transcriptase technique. So what is it? Reverse trans uh, transcriptase. We will know, and all that again I said is involving chapter 1.7. And again, open your syllabus. Go to chapter 1.7. You will see DNA replication. 
DNA and protein synthesis there, we will come across a topic called transcription and based on the technique, the scientists see the beauty of technology today. Without technology, we cannot exist. Today, our life is threatened and greatly this DNA technology has saved us. It has first of all allowed us to understand that okay, it is a RNA virus. Next, how to test it? Take RT-PCR. What is the basis for that? Reverse transcription. What is reverse transcription? Of course, we will discuss that, right? And how the vaccines are made? Maybe based on one, two, three technologies. What are these one, two, three technologies? Again, based on DNA, RNA. Now, what is this Zydus Cadilla vaccine? DNA-based vaccine? Again, DNA technology. Now, are you understanding? Say, anthropology is not only about only the cultures and societies, studying that simple society, taking their language, the notes on their language, their religion, their culture and coming back and writing a book. No, anthropology is, as a, is about, you know, applying this knowledge to the welfare of the society. So, DNA technology is uh, an extraordinary technology. Today, it is saving millions of life in the world today. It is because we, uh, uh, and because it is highly human. We are, we are actually trying to save ourselves, right? And anthropology is study of humans and uh, it is a study of our DNA. We go into the DNA level, we go into the gene level also and there is something called as genes, right, which we have spoken about in uh, several topics, gene, uh, DN, gen, uh, gene is also part of DNA and we will we'll be surprised and so, so much extraordinary wealth of knowledge is there, which once you know, you will like your life uh, that, you know, I can say uh, goes for a sea change that knowledge will make you an extraordinary person. And uh, going forward, guys in 9.2, we will be dealing with Mendelian genetics in uh, humans, that is right, we, that the application of uh, loss of Mendel's principles, Mendelian principles, because we first understand who is Mendel. Gregor Johann Mendel, he has been the pioneer of uh, genetics uh, in, in general and uh, human genetics has developed a, a great deal with the public rediscovery of Mendel's laws in the year 1900. So, first we will understand what are these principles of genetics or laws of inheritance of Mendel and then we will see how they are applicable to humans. So, Mendelian genetics in man includes these topics, family study, single factor, multi-factor, lethal, sub-lethal and polygenic inheritance. So, this chapter looks like small, but uh, it has a, a lot of base that is the Mendelian loss. So, once you are strong in Mendel's loss, you will be able to uh, understand all the other topics. So, 9.3 deals with the concept of genetic polymorphism and selection. This, this uh, cont continues with this uh, earlier chapters 9.1 and 9.2. So, we will be dealing with what is exactly the variation, the kind of uh, idea discussed by Darwin in 19th century. The idea called variation has found uh, favor with all the scientists. The scientists started uh, focusing more and more. Once the uh, genetics laws were discovered and applied in, in case of humans, then a lot has been, uh, I, can, I, I can say, added into this. The first knowledge is about the genetic polymorphism, that is a polymorphism at the gene level. You will be really surprised that kind of, you know, that polymorphism which makes us so unique, which each and every human being so unique in himself or herself is because of this genetic polymorphism. And this genetic polymorphism or rather polymorphism is at different levels, various levels we will see. So, this concept of genetic polymorphism we will understand and how it helped in a natural selection. Selection here means natural selection, because Darwin was arguing about natural selection as a key force of evolution. And we will also know about the concept of Mendelian population and how this extraordinary law called Hardy and Weinberg law has explained the reality of evolution in a nutshell, in an easy, uh, easily understandable equation. So, Hardy-Weinberg law goes and uh, 
uh, gets added to another concept called hardy weinberg equation. So, we will study what exactly is this and uh, population genetics has grown a great deal with the application of these concepts. Then what are the causes and uh, changes which bring down the frequency uh, in the you know that is gene frequency you will understand all these terms very deeply. Initially they will look like uh, new to you right. So, genetic free gene frequency they say that gene frequency is the one which is going to get changed generation after generation and uh, to explain that lot of factors are there besides natural selection, mutation, isolation, migration etcetera and uh, other forces like inbreeding and drift. So, we do understand a great deal about this topic because this topic is regularly being asked that is the reason I am marked it uh, important right. So, consanguineous and non consanguineous marriages or matings and how um, you know relatives when they when they have uh, in inbreeding when lot of uh, populations go for inbreeding that it is called consanguineous marriages in uh, humans especially it is called consanguineous marriages and how it increases the genetic load. Genetic load is another new concept that we will know right the negative uh, genes then consanguineous and cons cousin marriages how how this kind of inbreeding regularly increases some genetic effects the the problems which are seen in the children of the coming generations. So, these are the new ideas you will be um, learning in 9.3. So, coming to next topic that is 9.4 is extraordinarily important again I am putting two stars here like every almost every year this area is being asked in 2020 also they have asked how may the uh, genetic uh, I can say chromosomal aberrations affect humans how may genetic volume uh, this aberration chromosomal aberrations impact human disorders right genetic disorders. So, that we will discuss in detail with in, in two dimensions one is numerical and structural aberrations that is disorders that means children are born with some genetic problems. The reason is there is some problem in the chromosome the chromosomes have some problems in two levels one is the number of chromosomes and the structure of the chromosomes then if there are uh, deviants that is they are aberrations from the normal then they will lead to disorders. So, that is the reason this area is very very important from the examination point of view. One of some of the examples are Klinefelter syndrome, Turner syndrome, uh, then super female these are all actually the uh, sex chromosomal disorders. I will explain what are the sex chromosomal disorders or allosome disorders right and there are some autosomal aberrations which deal with the body that is autosomal aberration that is something wrong something is wrong in the other chromosomes which are not sex chromosomes right the general 21 chromosomes the 21 sets of chromosomes. So, all these lead to some problems like down syndrome, Patau syndrome, Edward syndrome and Credichat syndrome to name a few. Well, then we will also discuss about the last but not the least some kind of gene imprinting in human disease there is a very very peculiar way of uh, uh, I can say that, that we can distinguish between uh, whether this disease has come from the uh, father side or mother side. The same disease is expressed in a different way if it comes from the father side and in a different way from if it comes from the mother side. So, this is an interesting area called gene imprinting. Then genetic screening and counseling go hand in hand these two are related concepts right genetic screening and genetic counseling and uh, uh, both involve a lot of uh, other procedures which you have to collectively study. So, when we go there we will understand this question is also getting reg regularly asked genetic screening and genetic counseling and human DNA profiling is nothing but DNA fingerprinting something very commonly you guys might have heard about this DNA fingerprinting usually used in the criminal uh, kind of you know forensic anthropology to catch hold of the, uh, the criminals and for paternity diagnosis etcetera right. So, in human uh, DNA fingerprinting we will be using this knowledge of DNA and gene mapping 
and genome study. So yes, uh, yesterday while I was traveling, I got hold of a news article called Nucleome. There it seems Nucleome is some kind of an organization which uh, is responsible for sequencing of humans, human genes. So they will be sequencing all the genes in the body. Sequencing means it will be putting their what you call the that entire chain, exactly what is the uh, uh, nature of the chain right from the small uh, what you call that pairing of ATCG, right and it goes into so base pairs, it is, it is entire human uh, genome that means all the collection of the genes run into almost 3 billion base pairs. So these 3 billion base pairs structure, location, everything is mapped, that mapping is called genomics, genomics and genome study is very, very important in that angle. So I was mentioning to you, this Nucleome is that company which established a uh, largest uh, genomics, genomic, human genomic sequencing facility in Hyderabad, right, yesterday only that was, that new news has come, you can just check it, right. This is about the largest uh, gene, genome sequencing, which genome, human genome sequencing facility in South Asia. So, the current stuff also you, you should all be following whatever it is coming in the newspapers. So, this is a, not a started uh, what you call standard or static stuff, but it is a dynamic stuff. And going forward into the next slide is a very, very burning topic of late you might have seen in America there is a big movement going on and of course, the movement has slowed down a bit these days earlier last year. Uh, there was a black uh, person, Negro person got killed in the police brutality, right. And uh, from then onwards, again this concept of race and racism came to the forefront. Because humanity is suffering from another problem and anthropology as understands in, in, in its right spirit. So, anthropology says that look, we are all common human race, there are no races actually. But earlier there was a discussion of some races, right. There were some biological characteristics, the physical characteristics people were noticing and based on their physical characteristics, they were dividing humans into several groups like you know white people, negro people, uh, yellow people, mongol people, etc. That these kinds of racial criteria we will see, what are these criteria which went behind that and whether they are scientific or not we will examine and uh, we will examine how there is a relation between heredity and environment in the formation of the races, how races are formed, it is like right, it is not that someone created them separately. We are all same human beings as I said, we come uh, from a common family and uh, that is uh, uh, the, 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 the common uh, species is homo sapiens sapiens, right. And only because of some, some difference in the environmental conditions, unique place and uh, time impacts and how it has got inherited, uh, I mean inherited by the future generations. Based on that, the conditions have uh, made to form the new races. So, we will see what are the biological basis of racial classification and also how racial differentiation happens and race crossing has happened in humans saying that there is no single race. Again, the point we have started with and we will conclude that there is no separate, uh, there are no races actually, there is only one single human race. So, having understood that, we will go to the next topic that is uh, 9.6. It is also important from the examination angle regularly this ABO blood group system is asked, HB, RH system, HLA system, these are all uh, the ideas which I have uh, spoken about to you just uh, a while ago, so I, uh, in 9.3, you remember I spoke about genetic polymorphism, 9.3. So, there I said there is a polymorphism. So, what is polymorphism? Many forms, right. There are many forms of the genes like alleles and at the genetic level also there is this polymorphism at all, uh, but at the other levels also there is lot of polymorphism establishing our unique identity. This knowledge will help us understand why there are some blood groups which uh, uh, you know which cannot be transfused. We have we can get the blood from our own group only. If someone else's blood is given to us, we'll go for I mean right death and within a very short time. 
So, this is important in this and uh, it led to the discovery of this uh, uniqueness that is polymorphism and scientists went on uh, identifying and uh, seeing uh, new new varieties of different levels of polymorphism at the protein level, blood protein level, enzyme level and other uh, uh, levels right. So, that is the reason we, we mark it as very important and these come to be known as genetic markers also. These are not just any varieties or polymorphisms, but they, they help us understand the uniqueness, the uniqueness attached to humans in terms of their populations, their, their uh, I can say relations, how these genetic markers can be used to relate people rather than divide people. So, this the, the knowledge of 9.6 will lead you to understand that is uh, earlier we have noted about race right. In race we said there are uh, no separate races, but only one human race, but here we will understand that we are all related and we can be clubbed into different uh, blood groups and other groups, but not in the forms of any races. So, we have got lot of relations with each other and uh, based on this knowledge we will be able to understand that clearly. Uh, another uh, adjunct to this, this topic is what kind of uh, uh, hemoglobin levels differ based on the age and uh, other features right in uh, different socio-economic groups and different cultural groups. So, not only um, the, this uh, hemoglobin levels, body fat, pulse rate, respiratory functions and other uh, areas like sensory perceptions uh, occur differently in different groups. That means, we are not same again here. At the level of uh, genes and other levels, we have got this polymorphism but overall we belong to one species. So, this is a message that 9.5 and 9.6 want us to understand, I mean they give very loud and clear. So, this is actually the anthropological angle that we have to get, we, we should not get lost in this terminology and never ever uh, fear that it is all a jargon, no it is not a jargon actually, this is a base that you should know and this you should extend this knowledge to understand that it is all about understanding the humanity correctly, right, as it is needed. So, anthropology helps us very, very clearly in this. Now, coming to another uh, related stuff, I said different uh, people uh, in different parts of the world look different because of their environmental conditions, right. We said the races get formed because of different environments and uh, they are inherited. All the whatever, for example, in India we have. Uh, various different colors of people, some people are dark, some people are medium, some people are white, in, in, in colder regions of the world people are white, in uh, hotter regions of the world people are black, why it is so because they got adapted. So, a lot of ecological adaptations go, so all that comes under a heading called ecological anthropology, that is the reason we say this is the keyword adaptations. So, humans have adapted to their climates since thousands of years, thousands of years they got adapted and that is the reason their colors are different, their body sizes are different, their body fat composition is different, their heights are different. So, why they are different? Because of these factors and nothing like this, someone is superior, someone is inferior. So, we will go back into the, the uh, ground reality that is what kind of factors that they play, uh, that, that operate in this adaptations and uh, what are the non-genetic factors which help us in adapting to the conditions. It is not only biological, but also cultural. We also live in certain, people live in cold areas, people live in hot desert climates. So, they invent certain solutions, cultural solutions to get adjusted to that clim climate, extreme sometimes harsh climates. So, and uh, this is uh, uh, the logical thing, right. Next is how humans uh, suffer when they undergo some stress, especially in hot desert areas, that is temporary, temporary um, I mean uh, changes in cold uh, desert areas and or arctic kind of atmospheres, high altitude areas and uh, this is another interesting area again getting regularly asked, I think two years back also they have asked the question from this. So, almost all these areas are all highly related, that is a point I want to drive home and you kindly also focus this. Uh, initially, some of you may not understand all the ideas I am trying to convey in this syllabus discussion, but once you get going, once once we 
uh, start the journey and we see the the small uh, smaller uh, details right and the larger picture then you will be able to easily uh, connect then uh, if you go back after about 20 uh, 30 classes again go to the introduction then then you will see everything very clearly even if you don't all understand all this you will definitely understand the, the importance of syllabus discussion and the whole idea the larger picture is the most important picture i want you to understand right uh, stretching forward the idea of diseases the problems that humans suffer in all the areas in the world irrespective of their cultural background social background whether they are tribal people or they are in uh, cities and complex societies anthropology is also interested to know the the epidemiological dimension that is the disease the concept of disease the concept of health and how people view the disease what if you everybody asks right how are you people say i am good correct that that is a greeting we get every time so even if a person is suffering from fever also he says i am suffering from fever fever bolke they will not say in them uh, uh, immediately but first he says i am good but then second question if somebody asks you are looking dull and what happened yeah i am i'm having fever from last two days so people answer that i am good my health is good that is a general thing across the world how are you doing then they said i am good because there is this cultural disposition the culture ask us to treat the the condition of health and disease in a unique way each society has a unique way of looking at the health and looking at disease so again you see right anthropology enters here also anthropologists understand okay in 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 your society what kind of uh, viewpoint is there do they take this disease as a disease or just a some air some kind of some some problem in uh, with the spirits or some kind of a bad air that has come up earlier right till recently uh, i think uh, three four days back there was that ma malaria day right when the malarial parasite was found out by uh, our uh, ronald ross correct so earlier what is the name given to that disease they used to think it was malaria malaria means bad air so people used to think that bad air will get the disease so raise later it was discovered that the malarial parasite was responsible so it is anthropologists have lot of patience to go and sit with the people interview them understand what is what is wrong with you why it is considered as healthy and why what it is considered as uh, a disease everything uh, is also a ball game for anthropologists so we will see what kind of infectious and non infectious infectious diseases uh, plague the humanity and the cultural and social reasons behind them and we know that many societies suffer from this nutritional def deficiency related diseases many parts of the world many group age groups women children and other uh, groups right so many uh, i mean varieties are there lot of variation is there in this so anthropology enters wherever there is variation guys so that's the idea we are going to get in this 9.8 now coming to next chapter that is 10 chapter 10 deals with the human growth and development concept and how uh, very it, it is important to know at different stages of uh, human uh, life there are several clear cut stages and uh, like for example prenatal natal infant childhood adolescent and mature and senescence ages and we will see the the kind of factual information there it is only purely factual but once we know the factual information we will go back into the background and see what kind of the fact what are the factors that are affecting this growth and development because both growth and development are not same growth is different development is different we will see this different uh, factors like genetic factors environmental factors biochemical nutritional cultural and socio-economic factors operating behind this growth and development okay so this is one essential area again there is a related concept called aging and senescence and uh, there are several theories that were advanced to explain and understand this aging process and why people age why people get old and what happens inside the body so there are several theories that have come up and uh, we will add a lot kind of originality there okay and then there is this concept of biological and chronological longevity which 
according to scientists are different and uh, there are some uh, regular stuff that is the, your examiner wants you to understand that is the knowledge about human physic and somatotypes that is different body types one kind of persons uh, have a general disposition of right they are very very lean some are medium some are very fat so they are called as uh, ectomorph endomorph and mesomorph so different types of human physics and somatotypes are there then last but not the least methodologies for growth studies this is mostly kind of factual based chop topic chapter 10 is also highly scoring but mostly you have to get uh, yourself equipped with the factual information a great deal so this is also an important area from the exam angle and the chapter 11 chapter 11 has got three components 11.1 11.2 and 11.3 which deal with reproductive biology you have to be aware of all this uh, the essential ideas right like essential uh, I can say terms menarche menopause and other related other events related to fertility what happens uh, in societies how how societies view fertility right in every part of the world women are considered very important because we, without women there is no human race without women getting fertile that is pregnant and deliver the children no scope for human uh, I mean progress in the world so many societies see it as a very good sign but at the same time they have got social problems social issues economic issues growth issues related to that and we will see what kind of patterns we can see around the world and uh, differences as as far as this keyword called fertility is concerned right all these bio events lead to this concept called fertility and we'll understand what exactly are the differences in different parts of the world and uh, in 11.2 we will study certain theories demographic theories uh, which are of different types biological social and cultural it's mostly of theoretic uh, nature 11 11.3 uh, we'll talk about uh, another uh, related stuff related to fertility this this is a central keyword but related to that are other keywords like fecundity then there is something called natality and mortality we'll discuss all this in detail and they are all a good scope for short notes mostly short notes they are asked and uh, it's a cakewalk for you if you just understand the base of it it's a very easy topic and uh, highly scoring also and last but not the least in pay for one we've got applications of anthropology right uh, and better you understand it has applications of physical anthropology it is not just just uh, anthropology but applications of physical anthropology especially in the areas like sports nutritional anthropology anthropology in the design of uh, defense equipment and other equipments that is office equipment transport e equipment etc the application as i said uh, earlier of dna technology and etc in uh, the forensics that is criminal investigation right and how we reconstruct certain um, i mean scenes we you know crime scenes with the uh, help of forensic uh, knowledge and dna knowledge and how personal identification is done whether the person is being uh, right a male or female or dead long back or buried recently or it's a case of genocide or war so many uh, ideas we can generate from forensic anthropology and these two are related okay then uh, applied human genetics is also another key area paternity diagnosis these are uh, the old uh, stuff actually but uh, this is ever ever green genetic counseling we have also seen in 9.3 right and uh, eugenics is uh, an outdated concept but still you have to have the knowledge of this uh, idea cello and uh, in the last but not the least case dna technology we have already seen in uh, 9.1 how it is a uh, latest uh, technology to understand human genetics and how it is applicable in understanding and uh, solving the problems of human diseases and uh, the advancement of medicine in the form of vaccines etc medicines etc right and uh, there is also one concept called serogenetics and cytogenetics in reproductive biology especially with uh, uh, idea called blood groups 
in RH systems, we will uh, know in detail once you go there. Right, let us see paper 2, what exactly is there in paper 2 uh, syllabus. We have got uh, the first chapter, it is all about India, mostly India as simple as that. Paper 2 is called Indian Anthropology. It is a regular practice for us to understand this as Indian Anthropology, but there is nothing like that as per uh, the pain of syllabus setters. Just say, they just say understand how Indian culture and civilization started right somewhere in prehistoric times and how we have evolved. What are the, uh, I can, what are, uh, whatever the, I mean artifacts are available, certain skeletons that are available to, to say that okay, we have got prehistoric people in India, that is a culture and how people lived in cities and led an urban civilization, right. So, that is a ball game of the entire uh, chapter 1.1, it uh, translates easily into the next thing that is the demographic profile of India and inside that again we have got so many other uh, uh, backgrounds like uh, uh, I can say some um, scholars saying these are the uh, you know I can say racial and ethnic composition of India. For example, there are scholars like H. H. Risley, B. S. Guha and others who spoke about the unique uh, um, genetic ma that, that is that is uh, variations in humans, right, with respect to their color, with their skin color, hair form, nose form, bodily features, etc. They have uh, they have actually divided Indian people in or rather classified Indian people and uh, not only that, there are linguistic elements which are distributed throughout the Indian territory, right, and what kind of languages we have, how many languages we have, which are the ancient languages, which are the uh, uh, which uh, which kind of languages have come later, all that we will uh, know that is a very interesting stuff to start with and uh, different uh, dimensions of Indian population, why exactly is Indian population growing and what are the factors behind this, this is a socio-economic dimension we will go about to study okay? and why it has uh, grown uh, uh, rapidly in the recent years and why it is not coming down and what are the factors behind that. And chapter 3 speaks about the caste system in India, caste system and it is a very, very big uh, this thing chapter, but I have put this topic, this title, your examiner has not asked you to say that it is a caste system of India, but uh, in if you combine all the related topics here, that this title looks very, very apt. So, it starts with the traditional Indian society once upon a time, thousands of years back, how there were certain uh, concepts and principles which were dominating the society, which were influencing the society. The Indian social system was based on Varna Ashrama, Urushardha, Karma, Rina, Rebirth, etc. And all how are all are related. We will again see the beauty here. Then once you read all this, you will understand that they are all highly related to each other. And uh, similarly, how caste system in India started growing, right from this uh, ancient times pre-Vedic uh, or uh, early Vedic times and later Vedic times and uh, its structure and characteristics as uh, explained by Indian and foreign scholars. What is the difference between Varna and caste? Theories of origin of the caste system, there are so many theories, uh, someone are called as Indological theories, uh, traditional or divine theories, later from functional theories, etc. We will see uh, a bit of that also. There are extraordinary concepts developed by some Indian scholars like M. N. Srinivas, he gave this concept of dominant caste regularly coming in the exam, regularly and regularly, 2020 also they have asked recently, right? And uh, dominant caste, uh, what kind of ideas we have about caste mobility, that means whether uh, caste, uh, people of some one caste can uh, go and adopt another caste characteristic features, their occupation, etc. and how this caste system will be going to uh, I know in the future, right? The Jajmani system, which is a very, very unique system found only in India, as studied by the foreign and Indian scholars. And there is a concept related uh, to understanding the linkage between tribes and castes. There is a concept called continuum, as given by some 
foreign scholars the same continuum concept has been implemented to understand tribes and castes in india and uh, in 3.3 we'll study a very Im interesting uh, extraordinary person called uh, lp vidyarthi he came he gave uh, two concepts one is sacred complex and nature man spirit complex what are these complexes we'll study in detail and these are also very very important from the exam point of view and this usually 3.4 comes for 15 or 20 marker questions usually if all of these are asked they will be asked for 15 or 20 markers or they can go for individual uh, uh, they know religions like for example christianity impact of christianity on indian society or impact of uh, buddhism in indian society so this is again a very very uh, regular topic that we are going to discuss which is having an um, a, a relation with the caste system so though it looks like a religion it's based on religion but it has got linkage with the caste system and what is that linkage we will see and in chapter 4 we will be talking about how Indian anthropology has grown that means how anthropology has emerged and grown in India earlier I mentioned about LP Vidyarthi Lalit Prasad Vidyarthi gave a very clear kind of uh, I can say stages of growth or rather phases of growth of Indian anthropology so in uh, in uh, different uh, centuries 18th 19th and early 20th centuries it was dominated by scholar administrators especially the british scholars were british scholars uh, or administrators were the you know anthropologists they have uh, trans i mean they have uh, worked also as the anthropologists so indian anthropologists entered later into the scene of course there are pioneers in this for example there are scholars like um, L, um, L. K. Ananta Krishna Iyer, L. K. Ananta Krishna Iyer, and also S. C. Roy, who are highly like uh, recognized for their services, and they were given pioneering statuses in Indian anthropology, and how they have contributed to tribe and caste studies. So that is a very interesting stuff. Again, regularly asked in short notes. Chapter 5 deals with Indian village, a great concept which has attracted a plethora of scholars in India, especially after the Second World War. And earlier it was dominated by tribes and castes only. Right? Anthropological studies were uh, conducted by British and other scholars, Indian scholars, on only tribes and castes. But after Second World War, there was a big uh, leaps, leap in uh, the study of uh, the Indian society from village angle so village studies become very key here all the related phenomena whether indian village is a social system or not and whether the, the, there is this traditional uh, pattern is still there and uh, changing patterns are of not only settlement and also inter caste relations are still operating or not whether the agrarian relations which were existing in the zamindari times are existing or not right and whether there is an impact of globalization on Indian villages or not are the key questions which were answered by many Indian as well as foreign social uh, anthropologists and sociologists to understand this concept right and explain it in uh, different dimensions. So let me tell you very clearly here that uh, uh, we have to acknowledge our um, I can say cousin sister discipline called sociology. In paper 2, I will be speaking a lot about sociology also. There is this key word sociology coming up with the, in, the, in the discussions. I right? never get confused. We are not going to discuss any sociology, but we will, de we will definitely show our respect to sociological concepts, the, 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 the contributions made by the sociologists to Indian anthropology and social anthropology in, in general. Right? So, that is the reason we will use this. Uh, the acknowledgement to this sociologist also in this chapter and followed by several other related concepts in 5.2 because we have if you want to understand india we have to understand india in all the dimensions not only there are linguistic minorities in india but are also religious minorities and they have their peculiar social economic and political issues and problems and what kind of status are they living in the present day so when it comes to Indian anthropology, right, things get speeded up. That's the reason you can even see the syllabus discussion goes 
very fast here. So, the all this there is of course, only one liner here, but when we enter into the depth, we will understand what is the background of this minorities, why they have come up and under what context they are living in etcetera, etcetera. In 5.3, another important area, the see right, it is a bigger uh, topic as it looks, but yes, this is also uh, key for us from the examination point of view, entire chapter is important. We can put 3 stars here, 5.3, see 5 stars like 3 stars and 5 stars you can give. So, almost all these questions are coming regularly. This, these are the like favorite areas for the examiner. There are some um, ideas which explain India in its traditional sense and how the changes are coming up in the caste, in the way the people uh, get advanced, in the way people are actually changing their culture, their socio-economic outlook and how western influences have come and influence Indian society. What do you mean by modernization? and how it is different from westernization or same or these same or different we will understand. And uh, there is a new a unique concept which has come from uh, the foreign universities called little and great traditions. What are these little and great traditions we will have a look at. And this is a regular GS topic also for you, Panchayati Raj and social change which has brought about a lot of changes, Indian caste system and uh, women etcetera, backward classes right, SCs, STs and women also. So, a lot of changes that have uh, come up in the society with the introduction of the Panchayati Raj institutions. We will have a look at that because all are related to Indian village. See, 5.1 started with Indian village. So, Panchayati Raj is also related to Indian villages. That is the reason we will study from an anthropological, sociological angle. And uh, this is uh, the ever, ever present topic, ever alive topic. This can come directly or slightly twisted, but uh, this is the easiest thing you can actually deal with. So, how social change has been brought about in India from media also. It is not only from the government side by introduction of Panchayati Raj institutions, but also the society being influenced by the uh, ideas called media, the, the media as such. So, different media we will speak about radio, television, then uh, social media also okay, and television of course. And uh, chapter 6 onwards we will be dealing with tribal India, entire all the chapters 6, 7, 8 and 9 completely deal with tribal India except certain areas called scheduled caste and OBCs. Though it is uh, tribal India it is called, but uh, uh, the ma maximum almost 90 percent of the syllabus is of tribal uh, topics, but one or two topics are there for scheduled caste and OBCs. So, we will see what are the uh, backgrounds right and uh, right from the chapter 1 that is 6.1 the biogenetic variability found among Indian tribes. We will see why they are like in what kind of uh, situation they are living and uh, what kind of bodily differences they have what kind of languages they speak and uh, how different they are from the rest of the society and why they are unique, why they are uh, the most impoverished people among the Indians, among the poor. Within the poor, again they are the poorest and what are these socio-economic features they have okay? and uh, so many problems they suffer. For example, land alienation, a key area, poverty which is, uh, which is related to this, again indebtedness low literacy, poor educational facilities, unemployment, underemployment, health and nutrition status, which are nothing but a, like a list of problems, which are highly organic in nature in the sense they are all related to each other and we will see how they are related to each other and why they are like that. We will give some case studies also as and when it is required. So, in 6.3, we will see what kind of impact these developmental projects and industrialization etcetera had left on the tribal people, especially in terms of displacement and rehabilitation. So, many times we see in the newspapers also that tribal people are fighting for their rights, their land rights etcetera. Many big multi-purpose projects are coming up in tribal areas leading to their mass exodus, mass removal from their, uh, uh, their habitats, their, the huge uprooting that happens 
affecting their socio-economic lifestyle, cultural practices and beliefs. So, this we will see and related to that is uh, uh, development of forest policy and tribals. How forest policy has got emanated from the British time, colonial times in the 18th century, then it um, uh, transformed into 19th century, 20th century and how it was adapted by the Indian government after independence. Okay. So, all that how the forest rights, for example, forest rights act 2006, whether it has got any solution to that and how it is uh, happening practically all that we will have a look at. So, impact of urbanization and industrialization on tribal populations is also a key area because tribal people are also not any, uh, I mean they are not uh, separate group of people that they are completely isolated and nothing will uh, impact them. No, they are also part of the country and the developmental programs will be stretched into the tribal areas also. Many industries were set up in the in the in these uh, pockets and uh, because of industrialization, urbanization started right and uh, things started moving uh, a bit on their own impacting their social, economic and cultural lives. We will have a look at that in a detail. So, and uh, we will go into the next chapter that is 7.1, again it has got three topics. So, in 7.1, we will see how these people are ex exploited. Like I told you, there are other two groups of people called scheduled castes and obesis. Only in this chapter, we will see these people, except these two categories in 7.1. L everything, all this uh, chapter 6 to 9 deal with only tribal India. That is the reason we can call it as tribal uh, part and it comes not less than any 100 to 150 marks. So, if when I have counted 2020 and 2019 paper, tribal India accounted for more than about almost like 140 marks, more than 140 marks. So, it is a highly scoring area, mostly fact based, but I will try to make it more lively as lively as possible and constitutional safeguards as given to these people, scheduled tribes and scheduled castes and uh, uh, because they are the most backward of the people uh, of India generally and within them also there are so much variation and what exactly are, is that we will see from the constitutional background. And social change in contemporary tribal societies as we have noted in 5.3. Just like Panchayati Raj institutions have impacted Indian villages, they have also impacted the um, tribal areas. For example, there was an act that was made called PISA Act, PISA Act that is Panchayati Raj extension to tribal uh, extension to schedule areas act. So, this PISA Act is the one under which we study impact of modern democratic institutions on the tribal people in India. And uh, what are the other related issues? For example, developmental programs, welfare measures taken up by the governments for tribals and other weaker sections like SCs, etc. So, these are all mostly fact based, but I will give you a technique wherein you can actually uh, generate a lot of interest in that without getting uh, bogged down in details. And uh, last but not the least in 7, chapter 7 is the concept of ethnicity and how uh, people find themselves very unique and uh, why they are different, in what way they are different, what way they have uh, felt like that, their language issues probably, their regional issues probably, right, and their neglect, lack of development, etc., which led to conflicts and political movements and developments and uh, very rarely and uh, ex in extreme cases unrest was seen in form in, in the forms of revolts and revolutions and uh, a related concept as I said is regionalism and demand for autonomy in certain pockets of India, right, because as I said development cannot happen with the same speed in every part of the country. There is a, a small topic called pseudo tribalism, this area also we will have a look at social change among the tribes during the colonial times that is especially post independent India. Post independent India we have seen lot of social change that has come up in the uh, different parts of India as far as, far as tribes are concerned. Now, the, uh, the, the penultimate topic that is chapter 8 
chapter 8 has got 8.1 in that we will see impact of Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam and other religions on tribal societies. Just pause your video and just check what kind of, uh, have we uh, come across this kind of uh, topic earlier, right, you will notice that, yeah, earlier we have seen how in chapter 3, uh, different religions impacted Indian society, Buddhism, Jainism, Islam and Christianity. Now see here, we have added even Hinduism here, Hinduism, Buddhism, but we have removed Jainism, instead of Jainism, Hinduism has come, right, because we are talking about tribals here tribal people are also affected by the major religions. What are the major religions in, uh, of course, this order, number one is this Hinduism, number two is Christianity, number three is Islam and last but not the least is Buddhism, not in this order, okay. So all these uh, religions have brought lot of changes in the tribal society and what kind of uh, ideas, um, I mean, are existing, we will have look in detail. 8.2 deals with tribe and nation state, something related to the concept of ethnicity. Earlier we spoke about in 7.2, right, the concept of 7. Uh, uh, the 3, sorry, 7.3, we spoke about the concept of ethnicity. The same concept uh, also is uh, related to this topic 8.2. So, 7.3 and 8.2 are related and uh, understanding the ethnic composition of the certain countries and based on uh, their ethnic uh, separateness or uniqueness, several countries have uh, marched on from being tribes to nation states. There is a very clear concept called tribe and very clear concept called nation state and what is the relationship between tribe and nation state and in this how ethnic, ethnic equations came about, we will have a look at, right, not only from India but also from other countries examples. And uh, last chapter is 9th chapter, it has also got 3 topics that is 9.1, 9.2 .1, and 9.3. 9.1 is the larger of all the 3, right. We will have a look at the history of administration of tribal areas right from the British times. Not just the government of India uh, programs also, but some state government programs. Also tribal policies related to the forest and other areas and uh, plans and programs of tribal development and their implementation, whether uh, we will take a critical look actually, whether they have been implemented properly or not, what happened, what happened, uh, I mean what these different committees and commissions said about this, also we will look at. There is a concept of PTGs today, actually the, the syllabus says that, but the syllabus they have not corrected, but today we call them as PVTGs. This is not PTGs anymore, let me give the clarity, it is PVTGs that is particularly vulnerable, vulnerable tribal groups, PVTGs, particularly vulnerable tribal groups, S is small, all other, other are capitals. So this, the syllabus setter perhaps has ignored this, so there is a extreme, extremely impoverished and backward people within the tribes again, within the tribes also there are some groups which are almost like a far cry from development, they live in pre-agricultural societies, right, in, in conditions and where they are distributed, they have some special programs for their development and uh, welfare and uh, related to that is role of NGOs in tribal development, this is a different concept, okay. So this is something about 9.1, in 9.2 we will see how anthropology in its original nature contributes to tribal and rural development. What kind of ideas are there with anthropologists, whether they can assist the governments, whether they can uh, bring about some great change in the lives of the people, whether they are really capable of that or not, we will have a look at in chapter 9.2. And uh, the last topic of the entire syllabus is contributions of anthropology to the understanding of regionalism communism, communalism sorry and ethnic and political movements. So this is also being asked regularly, right, because 9.2 and 9.3 are related if you can just have a look, here also role of anthropology, that means contribution of anthropology and here also it is contributions of anthropology in understanding 
regionalism. They are, now we are very specific. They are general. Earlier it is general. Here it is specific. So nine chapter is also very important uh, from the examination point of view, guys. So with that, we will end the discussion about the syllabus, friends. So from the next class onwards, we will start physical anthropology. I will start with uh, uh, the human uh, right evolution and emergence of man, chapter 1.4 onwards. We will start. That is the starting point of physical anthropology, also called as biological anthropology. So kindly keep yourself ready with uh, the uh, syllabus first. I need your attention from the syllabus angle. While we go forward, I will also give you the list of books that you have to refer. Mostly my notes is enough. Most of the topics which are asked in the previous papers are covered. Okay, And uh, my notes is more than enough, but still for your reference purpose, so that you can actually fall back upon. Because textbook reading gives you an edge over others. Many, uh, I recommend very strongly you to go, go for reference books also, topic uh, on the specific topic, not general continuous complete uh, study of the textbook. No, it is not recommended. Go for topical or a sectional uh, study right, related to that particular topic. So, that will help you a lot in the exam getting edge over others. Right guys, so that is the end of the syllabus discussion. We will start the topics, uh, I mean uh, individual topics from that is 1.4 in the coming classes. Thank you very much. Have a nice time.